one, two. Good morning. Welcome to Sagamore's online worship service. We're so glad that you're here today with us. This morning, we're going through a passage in the book of James, and James is a well-loved book of the Bible because it gives us practical ways to apply our Christian living. And so as we look at James 4, we're going to see that God asks us to live humbly, and through following him in humbleness and just prayerfully asking him what he would have us to do, he gives us a victorious life to live and to do what he has for us to do. And so we're excited to see what God has for us from the word today. Now's a great time to get everything ready for the service, and so in the next few minutes, if you want to grab your Bible, grab a pen and piece of paper, or you can go to the YouVersion Bible app and download our online worship guide. It's got some great things for you and for your family. We're excited that you're here with us. We're excited to see what God has for us from the Word, and just let us know that you're here, that you're here worshiping with us. Let us know in the comment section, and send a text message to someone that you would like to invite to come worship with you this morning. We're going to be praising the Lord through the music and through the preaching of the word. And so in the next few minutes, if you could just take some time to ask God to bless the service and to bless our church family. We're excited to be with you today.
Good morning, church family. Those of you that are here with us and those of you that are watching with us on Facebook, we are thrilled that you joined us. And we know that there are some of you that just long to be in the house of the Lord. But we're praying that the um, the Holy Spirit will just work through that camera and through that computer or have whatever your means you're watching. And, that, and He will speak to you and you'll be encouraged. And you know that we know that you want to be here. And we know that... Um, in fact, why don't everybody stand up and turn around and look at that camera and just wave at our church family that's watching, okay? Can you kind of pan the audience there and, and, and see everybody? We are um, Pastor Denny and Miss Cheryl are at home. Uh, Pastor Denny had an outpatient procedure this week, and he's passing kidney stones right now. And um, But... Um, Regardless of what's going on, don't sit down, church family. Regardless of what's going in, on in our lives and in our world, we're going to praise the name of Jesus. Let's sing it together. Praise the name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise. Other name that's higher, no other name that's stronger, no other name forever. I will praise the name, no other name can heal us, no other name can free us, no other name so precious. Let's praise the name. Do you believe that? Say amen your mask and all. Let's sing it again. And praise the name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise the name Jesus, name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same. other name that's higher, no other name that's stronger, no other name forever. I will praise the name, no other name can heal us, no other name can free us, no other name so precious. Let's praise the So precious, let's praise the name, Jesus. Give him praise this morning, amen, amen. It's so good to see your smiling faces and see your smiling mask, amen, amen. I'm so thrilled that we can join together and be encouraged and um, be reminded that he is faithful. And he is here for us, and he is standing with open arms ready to receive us. Search no more, there is an answer in this world of doubt and fear. He has come to lift your burdens, you will find your God. For the pain 
This is our time that we join together and pray as a family of God. Pastor Lewis is going to come and lead us in our prayer, and we rejoice that his father is doing better, and we rejoice over, rejoice over that. And My dear friend that many of you have been praying for, Minister of Music at Big Creek Baptist Church that had COVID, he is now out of ICU, and, and we're praying for that entire church staff. Um, they had just had, had many cases that broke loose in that church and in their choir. We want to pray for them. There are others that we want to pray for in our church family, and we rejoice that he's answered prayer and he's continuing to heal because he's in the healing business. Amen. So let's pray together. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you this morning again thanking you for a day, a day that you made, a day that we get to rejoice a day that we get to worship you and a day that we get to be glad because you are our God and you've called us to be your people through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so today, God, we just want to glorify you, thanking you, Father, that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died on the cross for us, God. We don't deserve your mercy and your grace, but because of your great love, you give us mercy and you give us grace. And so, Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for Jesus who came and did die on the cross to be the propitiation, to be the substitute for the death that we deserve. God, but he didn't just die on the cross. He was buried in the grave. According to the scriptures, he raised him to new life so that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts you raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. And so, God, we worship you because even today is a day of salvation. And so, God, we want to honor and glorify you today. But, God, we still live in this world, this world that's full of turmoil, this world that's full of strife, this world that's full of burdens and hurts. Father, and there's us that come, there's many of us that have physical ailments. God, there's financial needs. God, there's just depression. There's brokenness. God, we just look around our world and we see the hurt and we see the pain. But, God, we know the answer is the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to cling to the hope of Christ and we're going to lay our burdens down at the foot of the cross this morning at this altar. God, knowing that you're going to meet our needs according to your riches and your glory in Christ Jesus. And so God, as we worship you today, be glorified and let us glorify you as you called us to be your people. But God, let us also be about the business of taking this good news to a hurting, dying world that needs Jesus, God. We want to pray right now for that one man, that one boy, that one girl, that one woman that you've laid on our hearts to share this gospel message with, Father, that your spirit will draw them to yourself. And so, God, let us continue to be diligent about taking this good news to lost people so that they can know you and they can have salvation that only comes from you and you alone. Pray all these things in the powerful name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Sagamore Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Taylor and I'm the Associate Pastor of Family Ministries. And we're glad again that we can join together here today in our worship center. Or you may be watching in our student room this morning or watching online on Facebook Live or at our website at www.sagamorechurch.com. If you are a guest with us today, we would love for you at this time to just text the word WELCOME, WELCOME to 
592-8513, and you'll receive a text message back that will give you a link to a contact form, and one of our pastors this week would love to contact you and get to know you a little more. You also can go to our website, sagamorechurch.com, scroll to the bottom and fill out an online connection form. You can submit prayer requests. You can share the praises that the Lord has done in your life this week. You can also respond using that connect form as well. So I encourage you guys to do that so that we can stay connected with you this week. Well, this morning, we have the opportunity to glorify God and to equip believers and equip our families to go share the good news of Christ, as we're all called to do in Matthew 28. And at this time, we want to watch our Sagamore highlight video and find out more opportunities we have over the next upcoming weeks for opportunities to serve here at Sagamore. As VBS Week is quickly approaching, you can support the mission to reach our neighborhoods in two ways. You can donate food items listed in the worship guide, and you can sign up to serve by preparing for, serving at, or participating in follow-up the week of August 3rd through 6th. Please visit the link on our website to see how you can serve this summer. America is a nation in great need. The greatest need is to turn away from our sins and turn to God. Join us Sunday, July 5th for our annual God and Country Day as we humbly pray for God to hear his people and heal our land. We will have patriotic music, prayer time, and a message. For more information on these and other events, please see the worship guide or find us on Facebook. And we do want to encourage you that um, our prayer guides are going out through email. And if you do not receive that um, if you did not receive one this week, be sure and, and check your junk mail and make sure that it's not there because sometimes it goes there. And, and if, you, if we have the incorrect email address, if you haven't received an email from Pastor Denny or the church in the last week or so, if you will uh, either text that to us, if you will email that to us, or you write it down on a, on a piece of paper and drop it in the offering, envel uh, offering plates and... Um, we would make a change of that because we'd love to send that to you. And those of you that are watching on Facebook, we want to encourage you to send your prayer requests too because that's, we're, that's how we keep connected with many of you. And I want to thank those of our church family, how you continue to reach out to one another and check on one another. Now, as you know, we do not pass the plates for our, to receive our tithes and our offerings, but there are offering plates that are located at each door and then here at the Lord's Supper table. And we thank God for his faithfulness to us, and we thank God for how he continues to provide for us. And we want to ask God's blessings upon this offering. And so I would like to ask that all of us stand together, and let's ask God's blessings on our tithes and offerings that have been received today. Also, those that have been received through our um, PayPal and other forms. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Jesus, for um, an opportunity to give back just a portion of what you have given to us. We're so undeserving of your love and your faithfulness and your mercy and your grace. We ask God that you would bless our offering. We ask God that you would multiply it and use it for your honor and glory as we share the gospel to a lost and needy world. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's remain standing and let's sing. Lost or saved Find their way At the side of your great name, all condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name.
I've watched it, I don't know how many times this week. And it's a message. In fact, I shared it with some of you that shared it. It is a message from Billy Graham from years ago, years and years ago. And he talked about how I don't put my faith and my trust in government. I don't put it in man. I don't put it in institutions. But I put my faith and trust in the healer. I put my faith and trust in Jesus and his word will stand forever for he is king of kings and he is Lord of lords. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh. Father, that we can stand in your presence, that we can sing praises to you, that we can be reminded of your love, that we can enter your, your throne to pray, and that you stand there with loving arms to receive us. Father, I pray that our praise has been worthy. I pray now for Pastor Taylor. I pray, God, that as he shares the word that you've laid upon his heart, that we'd be receptive to that word. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated. 
Well, good morning again. And uh, I am always humbled and just honored to be able to have the opportunity to stand here before you and share the Word of God with you. And, and uh, I, one of my spiritual gifts is teaching, and I love teaching, um, but I know many of you could teach me. You have so much wisdom to offer, so it's very, uh, I just love this opportunity, and it's a humble experience to come before you, and I'm so thankful for a staff and for our pastors who give me the opportunity to, to do this, and so I'm uh, just excited to be here this morning with you guys. We want to continue to pray for our pastor um, Friday he had a procedure done to um, help with some kidney stones that he's been having, and um, hopefully he, the procedure went well. He's at home recovering. He's doing well, um, still sore, and still trying to rest. Sometimes we need to be told to rest, and so we told him, you need to rest this weekend uh, as well. But also, we want to pray for Miss Cheryl. Many of you got an email uh, last night, um, um, but Miss Cheryl, there's some markings that have appeared on uh, her left lung, and we want to pray that those are, are just errors in the imaging, right? And, and we just want to pray that whatever it is, it's, it's, uh, it's able to be quickly healed. And so continue to pray for the Grinna family and pray for the boys this morning. They are, I guarantee you, watching right now. And so uh, I wanted, whether they were here or not, I want to also real quick just say that during this COVID time, um, it has just been remarkable of our pastor and his shepherding and his leadership over our congregation and church making difficult, hard decisions. And I know all our staff has made, had to make some difficult, hard decisions, and you guys have had to make some difficult decisions as well. But all of that weight, I feel that weight, but I know our pastor feels that weight as well. And so I'm just, we, we just want to say we love our pastor this morning. And I know that he's watching, and you can say a big amen in and he'll hear you this morning. Um, so we are so thankful for his leadership and uh, his family this morning. Well, we will be in the book of James this morning. Uh, Pastor has been in the Psalms for s several weeks, a couple of months now, and it's been encouraging to me the last few weeks of uh, talking about fathers, um, and it, that's been encouraging to me. Uh, but we're going to take a break from the Old Testament and go into the New Testament in the book of James. We'll be in James chapter 4, and we'll look at the first 10 verses this morning in James chapter 4. If you're watching online, watching on Facebook, or you're in our student room, I encourage you also at this time, if you have a Bible, to turn with me to James chapter 4, and we're going to look at the first 10 verses this morning. Well, let's stand in honor of the reading of God's word at this time. In James chapter 4, starting verse 1, it says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he 
will exalt you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we are so thankful for your word. Your word is like a double-edged sword. It can pierce our hearts this morning, and that's what we ask. We ask that our eyes be open, our ears be attentive to the message that you want us to know and learn, and we can apply that to our lives, God. In all things today, we want to give you the glory, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so the title that of this message is Humble Ourselves in the Battle. Humble Ourselves in the Battle. Folks, we are fighting battles in our world today. We see wars of racism. We see wars of disease. We see battles all over the place. Spiritual warfare is happening in our country and in our world and even among Christians and even among believers. And so before I like to go verse by verse, that's usually how I like to to teach. Um, But before we do that, I think it's important that we look at some background on James and who James is and the book of James and what's going on here. And so the question raised to myself is, who is this James that writes um, this book? We look in the New Testament and we see that there are several Jameses, probably at least three Jameses that are in that are listed in the New Testament. The first James that is listed is James, the son of Zebedee. And we know the story of James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, and they were fishing, and Jesus came by and said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they dropped their nets and left their father and followed Jesus. This James is sometimes called James the Great, maybe because he was in Jesus' inner circle. Um, We know that John and Peter and James were those three. Sometimes Andrew was included in that, but those three that were part of the inner circle of Jesus. We know that those three were ones that went to Um, went farther in the garden of Gethsemane as Jesus was praying in the garden, that they went up to on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus as well. This is the inner circle of Jesus. And this James, the son of Zebedee, was part of Jesus' inner circle. But we also know that that James probably died around 44 A.D., And this book is believed to be written in 48 AD by scholars and looking at different documents. And so it's strongly believed that that James was not the one who wrote the book of James that we read here in the New Testament. We also see a second James in the New Testament who was another disciple of Jesus, James, the son of Alphaeus. He was sometimes called James the Less. Uh, Maybe he was shorter, maybe he was younger, Uh, Maybe he was smaller in statue, but most likely, too, that he was a disciple that wasn't in Jesus' inner circle. There is very little known about this James. But in John 7, 5, it says, For not even his brothers believed in him, meaning Jesus, that his brothers did not believe in him. Some say that this James, James the son of Alphaeus, could be a half-brother or a brother of, of Jesus. But if he was a disciple of Jesus, then that would conflict what John 7 tells us, that not even his brothers knew him at the time of his ministry on earth. So this James could not have been a brother of Jesus since he was a disciple. That would also go for James, the son of Zebedee, that he could not have been a brother of Jesus. So these two Jameses are probably not brothers, and there's strong, strong evidence that show that this James was probably the brother of Jesus who wrote, who wrote this book. And so there's more evidence that shows that James, who is sometimes called James the Just, scholars believe that this James may have wrote this book. And you can look in Mark chapter 6, and it lists the brothers of Jesus. And James is one of those brothers. Again, in John 5, before the resurrection happened, this James did not believe in Christ. Can you imagine being a brother of Jesus and not trusting and believing in him? 
But it says his brothers did not believe in him. But then we see when Jesus, after the resurrection, and he appeared to many, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appeared to many, including James, his brother, with his mother Mary. And so if he saw the resurrection, we are to believe that he now believes in Jesus, right? He saw the resurrection of Jesus. And so we know that James had a conversion experience when he saw Jesus after the resurrection. We see in Acts 15 that James just wasn't just, he just knew Jesus and had a conversion experience. He started to become a prominent leader in the church in Jerusalem. Paul writes, Um, In Galatians 2, that he was a pillar of the church. We see in Acts 15 that he was a spokesman for the church. He probably became even the pastor or the bishop of the church in Jerusalem here. So it's incredible to see that this James is the one, probably the brother of Jesus who didn't trust in Jesus, is the one writing of these truths in James chapter or in, in the book of James. We also can see before we get into James chapter four, uh, in chapter one, James introduces himself and he says in chapter one, verse one in James, it says, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He he introduces himself as a bond servant of Christ, uh, of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He could have said, "Well, I'm a brother of Jesus," or "I'm a disciple of Jesus." Paul did that in his letters, uh, in the in the Pauline epistles. He said, "Paul, and a disciple of Jesus." But James here says he's a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can look over to Jude. In the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 1, as Jude introduces himself, and Jude says, I'm Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. So the same language that is happening here with Jude, we also can see that back in the Gospels as they introduce the brothers. There is a brother named Judas that could be this Jude as well, or maybe there's another half-brother. But we have strong correlation that this James is the one who is the brother of Jesus. And notice also in James chapter 1, verse 1, he says, "...to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad." meaning the 12 tribes of Jacob, meaning the ones who are Christians even outside of Jerusalem, everywhere, dispersed everywhere from from many generations ago. So when we look at Paul's letters, those in Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all these letters, they're written specifically sometimes, or to churches, even though we can gain knowledge for them and they do apply to our life, This specific book is written to all Christians. I believe that James wrote this book to Christians dispersed everywhere, even to us. And so even more applicable is this book of James to us this morning. So uh, we want to look verse by verse and see what is James telling us here. James is um, called James the Just, remember. He has a lot of practical things. In fact, there is this conflict that some scholars see between Paul and James because Paul preached on faith and grace and James preaches a lot on works. And some say, well, there's this conflict. How can that be? And I hope today uh, to, to be able to say that, that they, it wasn't conflict, but that they were working together that without work, without, without works, that your faith cannot be shown, and that it is through works that our faith is shown. But works doesn't save us, right? Works doesn't save us, but when people look at us, we should be looking a little different than the world that we live in. And so I hope that is what is I'm able to share today, and I believe that's what James was trying to share as well in chapter 4. So let's look at chapter 4, verse 1. And our first point today that we want to make is when we submit to ourselves, we gain nothing and are at battle against other believers. 
When we submit to ourselves, we gain nothing and are at battle with other believers. Let's look at the first three verses here in chapter 4. It says in verse 1, What is this source of quarrels and conflicts among you? James asked this question. I, I like starting a conversation with a question, right? James asked this question. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? In the, in the Greek, um, it is kind of better explained as what place is this coming from? If James was able to speak in front of us today, I think he would say, what place are these conflicts and quarrels happening here? James lists two types of fightings here. He lists the quarrels and he lists conflicts. And in the Greek also, it's closer to battles and fightings is the language that is used. And so when we look at it like that, battles and fightings, we see that one could refer to some serious disagreements that happen, but the other could uh, refer to sustained fighting, maybe even physical, um, maybe even violent, but definitely long lasting. My grandfather was uh, a deacon of the church. He has been gone, been with the Lord for about 14 years now. Uh, next year, he, if he was still alive today, he would be 100 years old. And he uh, was, uh, again, a deacon in his church, and he had his best friend was a deacon in their church as well, and they had a, a disagreement uh, later on in their life um, about something. I, we don't even know what it was, and, uh, but they had this disagreement, and it ended up causing them not to talk to each other for several years, and they were best friends. And when my grandfather's best friend was... Um, dying, he went to him and, and made it right. But what a sad situation. Sometimes all of us, sometimes we we find ourselves in where we're quarreling and conflicting among each other. And why? Why is that happening? We see this in the Bible in several places where Abraham and Lot have this conflict with each other and they go separate ways. We see Jacob and Esau have this conflict with each other, uh, fighting over their father's birthright. And they go separate ways and don't talk to each other for 20 years because of a quarreling or a conflict that happens. We see that even churches that Paul writes about in his letters had conflicts with each other. And we see this language here again in, in James uh, chapter 4 where there's this battling and conflicting and waging war. This is a war that happens among believers. Having conflicts and quarrels and fights among each other, it wages war among Members And James answers, why is this happening? What place is this happening? He answers it with another question. And he says, it's not the source, your pleasures, that wage war in your members. You know, we tend to like to blame the other side, right? We tend to say, no, that conflict or quarreling or fighting, that, that's someone else's fault. That's their fault. They have to make it right first, and then we'll be able to settle this. Um, but it's our pleasures, our sin, our selfishness that causes these conflicts and quarrelings to happen. And these still happen today. We all need to ask ourselves this question today. What is the source of quarreling and conflict among us? Is it me? Is it my pleasures that are, is causing these things to happen James continues on in verse 2. He says, you lust and do not have. You commit, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And he lists these pleasures that happening. No, I want to note real quick that there are, are different versions. You even may be reading that say it a little differently. It may say something like, you lust and don't have. You murder and are envious. You cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Um, the different versions have different things because uh, in the interlinear Bible that tells what the Greek has, there's no punctuation in that. Um, and so it's, it's hard to know how that lies. But it really doesn't matter because you could say you lust, you murder, you're envious, you fight and quarrel, and then you still have nothing. 
That's what he's saying here. Just like in James chapter 2, he says, for, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all of it. You know, you lust, you murder, you're envious, you commit something against God, you, you, you submit to yourself, and you're going to be the enemy against the Lord and against his people. Um, James, in, and really through the whole book of James, you can see a lot of parallels with the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus uh, preached about. And you, you may even recognize uh, some of this as you're reading it. But, you know, we're reminded when he talks about so you commit murder, the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus said, you shall not commit murder in Matthew chapter 5. And he says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be guilty. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty. Because, James reminds us again, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at one point has become guilty of all of it. James chapter 1 also says that then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. That's the hard reality for us, that these things that we, when we submit to ourselves and commit these things, then this lust conceives to sin, and sin leads us to death. And we do all these pleasures because we do not have. We also, in verse 2, it says, you do not have because you do not ask. We're also reminded again on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who asks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Many times we don't receive because we do not ask God in the first place. When was the last time we humbly got on our knees and asked God to heal our land or to help us in our world or help us not to submit to ourselves but to submit to him? You know, my my Carrie's parents, uh, Carrie's dad is a pastor and, um, and they're just, they're, Carrie's parents give so much wisdom to us, and we love chatting with them. And we went um, this weekend and dropped our boys off. We actually traded kids. She, they had Caroline for a while and then uh, traded. The, that's kind of the summertime thing that we like to do if we're able to. And um, we got to just talking about just what's going on in our world. And I was reminded of the fact as talking to her parents that, um, that you know, really, we should expect we should expect the lost to behave a certain way, but we shouldn't expect believers to be behaving a certain way. And it's our job, it's our job to humble ourselves and get on our knees and ask God for help in, in, our, in ourselves and in our nations, in our families and in our world. You ask and do not Receive, verse 3 says, because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. The Greek uh, refers to it as you're requesting, but it's not getting up there. You keep talking about this, but it's not going higher than the clouds because you're asking with the wrong motives. You may have heard this story before. There was a pastor who had a young daughter, and uh, he, the young daughter watched him pray um, about five minutes before he would come up and preach and did that week after week. He would pray about five minutes before getting up to preach. And one day the daughter asked him, why do you, dad, why do you pray before getting, getting up to preach? And he became proud that she noticed and proud that this maybe was a teaching moment. And uh, he said, well, I'm praying that I will preach a good sermon every week before I get up. And she replied, well, why hasn't he answered your prayer yet? (laughs) 
No, sometimes we pray with the wrong motives and we focus on the things about ourselves instead of glorifying God as we pray. In verse three, we also says, it says that so that you may spend it on your pleasures. This spend is the same spend uh, that is used in the parable of the prodigal son where he had uh, an inheritance and he went and uh, frivolously just spent his money and he was doing it for his own selfish pleasures. That's how we spend sometimes our prayers. We pray to God and say, God, if you'll just do this, uh, this will help me so much or it will help us so much. And we forget to just pray, God, your will be done. Or we want to give you glory in what we are praying about. Help us to pray the prayer that uh, help us to ask what we need. You know our every need, God. Help us to pray that. So if we choose to submit to ourselves, we gain nothing and we are at battle with others, and it will bring forth death in this battle that we are fighting. This is a real battle we're fighting in our world, and it will eventually bring forth death. Our second point that I want to mention is when we submit to the world, we are at battle against the Lord and his word. When we submit to the world, we are at battle against the Lord and his word. James shifts some of this battle uh, language and, and turns it into this marriage almost, that, uh, this picture of marriage that happens here. In verse 4, we read, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. God created husbands to be a leader and to be a provider and protector of their family. And he created wives to be submissive to the husband as the Lord leads him. And the husband is to love his wife and the wife is to respect and honor the husband. And that is the picture and the, the marriage that God created for it to be. In the same way, God creates that for us. We are his bride, and he is our provider and our protector, and we are to submit to the Lord. He loves us so much, he sent his son to die for us, and we are to honor him and respect him. But sometimes we don't, and we even go to the point where there's cheating against God. Friendship with the world is hostility toward God. This friendship with the world, looking at the Greek, could also be said as counseled with the world, seeking the world, seeking wisdom from the world, trusting in the world. When we put our trust and our wisdom and seek the world, we're cheating on God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Back to this battle here. When we submit to the world, we're at battle with the Lord. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be on the, the other, the enemy side of God. Because I know that God wins the battle. And so I don't want to be on the enemy side. I want to be friendship I want to be submissive to the Lord and not of the world. In verse 5, it says, Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? James is saying, if you don't believe this, then maybe you must not think the Scripture speaks to any purpose. Because it says he jealously desires the Spirit which he has made to dwell in us. You cannot serve two masters. Again, the Sermon on the Mount, some of these references from here, as Matthew 6, 24 tells us, you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve God and serve the world. You can't, in, in, a, in a relationship with a husband and wife, they, you can't cheat on each other. You have, it, for, for it to be holy, you are, you are, you love each other and you are, um, you are with each other and you submit to each other in the way that God intended it for it to be. 
And you cannot serve two masters in the same way as God says here. You can't serve the world and be cheating with the world and still have a relationship with me. And this way also, he jealously desires the spirit, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, as we see the fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5, that we all have love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that the spirit gives us because he resides in us. He is made to dwell in us. So he jealously desires that spirit, which he has made to dwell in us, Because he created us to be his bride and created us to be submissive and honoring to him. And this jealously, I I looked at this word and I thought, that's a strong word to be used here. But it's a righteous jealous, just like us in any marriage. A spouse is jealous of their spouse spending this, spending, being friends with the world cheating on them, there would be this righteous jealousy that happens. And the Lord has righteous jealousy of our relationship with him. He created us to have a relationship with him. And yet we break from that and do what our selfish desires tell us to do. How do you think it, God feels when we cheat on him with the world? When we submit to the world we're at battle against the Lord and his word. We are his enemy. Thankfully, I don't stop there and just walk down because there's hope that uh, is coming here in James, uh, the rest of James chapter 4. And our third point today is that when we humble ourselves before the Lord, we will be lifted up in this battle. In verse 6, it says, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I love this word, but, in, in the scripture because it's a shift. It's a change that happens. Now it's saying there's hope because the first five verses, there wasn't much hope to that. But now there's hope in that what, what's happening. God gives us even, or, or James, I'm sorry, reminds us of the promises that God gives us here in these verses. There's a promise of a greater grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. This grace is a gift. We're also reminded that Paul writes in Ephesians, again, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. We would think that this passage is all about works, but James reminds us it is about grace. There's a greater grace that happens, and the works are just the fruit of our salvation. You know that there's, again, strong language here. Even though there's hope that is happening here, it says God is opposed to the proud. Proud. Is our world full of boasting and pride today? You know, we're prideful, we're so prideful, and think of ourselves as so important of our race. We're prideful of our gender, prideful of our economic status, our fame, our power, how we appear to be in front of others. We're even prideful today of crimes and lawlessness that happen. We're so prideful of ourselves. And the sad part is, it's even professing believers in Christ. Our identity has become in these things. We place our identity in our race and in our gender and our economic status and our fame and power and and of ourselves. And our identity is in the things of this world, but our identity needs to be in Jesus Christ. As believers, we must put our identity in Christ and humble ourselves from the prides of this world. So many professing believers put so much pride in those things and they forget to glorify God and be humbled so that he can be exalted. 
Again, I don't want to take away from the fact that we need a humble humility and speaking the truth in love go hand in hand. We still need to speak the truth in love as Ephesians chapter four tells us to do, but we can't speak the truth in love to a a world that's lost and dying or to professing believers that are backslidden or doing things that are not honoring to God before we first humble ourselves. The promise and the hope is that he gives grace to the humble. In verse 7, it says, submit, therefore, to God. This submit to God is a military term. In this war, in this war that, that this picture that James is painting here, it's this, this picture of this private in the army even obeying the commands of the general of the military. If the private decides to do his own thing and, and follows his own orders, it can cost the whole battle. But if he submits to the general, submits to the plan that the general has, they're more likely to win the battle because of it. And they can work together to do that. Sometimes we think submitting to God makes us, makes us uh, so humble that we're not able to do anything because of it. But I'm here to say that that's not the case, as we'll see in verse 10, that when we submit ourselves, we will be exalted. And that's the whole paradox of all of this, that we should resist the devil, resist to stand firm, to be not movable, not changing. We sing the song, I shall not be moved. And sometimes that means we can't move out of our pews and our seats at church. Um, But I shall not be moved where I will resist and stand firm against the devil. We know that the devil, sin, one of his sin, the the sin that he, uh, we see all through scripture that he tempts is pride. Pride even cast him out of the presence of the Lord in Ezekiel 28. It compares the beauty of the enemy with the king of Tyre. It says, your heart was so proud because of your beauty. You thought you were so beautiful and you were so proud of it. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor and I cast you to the ground. The, th- the devil thought so much, the enemy thought so much of his, of his self and his own beauty Do we, as believers in Christ, think too much of our own selves? Now, Adam and Eve, this is the picture of pride happened here in 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 where sin, the first sin happened. And the, the enemy used, you can have knowledge like God, used a sin of pride where Eve committed the sin And Adam followed suit with her. But there's this promise. When we resist the devil, he will flee from you. What a hope and what a promise that is. We see this beautifully in the picture of Jesus uh, in in Tempted in the Wilderness. Three times the enemy was, was tempting him. And the last time the devil uses pride against Jesus. I will give you all of these kingdoms. And glories of the world. You can have all of this. But Jesus responds, and it's how we all should respond. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil fled from him, the scripture says. When we resist the devil, he will flee from you. When we resist the devil with the word of God, he will flee from us. We must remember this hope and this promise that we have. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from us. In verse 8, it talks about to draw near to God. James says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. When This is another promise that James says. When we draw near to God, he'll be draw near to us. A.W. Tozer said it like this, nearness to God brings likeness to God. The more you see God, the more of God will be seen in you. 
In other words, the closer we are to God, the more like God we are and others will see we are more like him. And we have more opportunity to share the gospel. We have more opportunity for people to look at us and go, what's different about them? Instead of saying, you're a hypocrite. James also says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The 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 Christians, uh, the followers of God are used to this idea, uh, especially in, in Jerusalem, of cleansing your hands because it was seen uh, to be in the presence uh, in the temple. You had to be clean. You had to publicly wash your hands and be clean before being uh, in the presence of the altar with God's people. Uh, it was seen as being holy publicly. But it's not just being seen publicly holy. You really are. You really are changed, internal, authentic holiness that happens. And that's why James is saying, cleanse your hands, you sinners, but purify your hearts. When you purify your hearts, your hands will be cleaned. David, we're remind, this reminds me of the, the story of David, where David committed adultery and he committed murder and we're reminded in, in Psalm 51, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Even David asked for repentance and drew near to God, and God drew near to him. In verse 9, it says, Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. When was the last time you and I were brokenhearted so much with a humble spirit about our own sins or about the sins of our brothers and sisters in Christ? When was the last time we were so brokenhearted about about our state that we had misery and we were mournful and we're weeping, as James mentions here in verse 9? Not out of judgment, as James will continue on in 11 and 12, but mourning actually brokenhearted for our other believers and for our neighbors. James reminds us that our pride sometimes can cause us to think nothing's wrong. We're, we got it all together. We can go on our day with selfishness and laughter and all of these things. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with laughter. In fact, we can have joy in all circumstances. But there's also a time where we need to weep. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us that. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh. We need to be reminded that there's a time to weep for our believers, for other believers and ourselves. There's a time to weep for our world and our society and our country. And brothers and sisters, the time's now. We need to be weeping. We need to be brokenhearted and on our knees at the state of where we are because we're in battle and we need the Lord. Verse 10, this is really the key to all of what James is saying here in verse 10. It says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. There's this paradox this irony here that when we humble ourselves and makes ourselves low, we're going to be lifted up. Jesus said it in the parable of the guest in, in Luke 14. It says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We know that Jesus himself was made humble. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is what James is saying here that through our humble Lord, He humbled himself just to come to earth. And he was born in a humble manger and lived a life as a humble carpenter and a humble servant and even had a death that was humiliating. But thank the Lord, he was exalted three days later. 1 Corinthians, this is our verse these verses here at Sagamore that we so strongly believe in and we repeat them time and time again because it's the gospel and it's what we believe in. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4 says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He humbled himself so much that 2 Corinthians five twenty one says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is grace. This is this greater grace that James is talking about, receiving this gift of righteousness when we deserve death. We have a long list of, just like James pointed out to us, of lust and all of these sins, envious, when we sin, when we sin one, we sin them all. And James pointed, reminded us of this grace is a gift. If Christ never died for our sins, then in our motto in our world right now should be no life would matter. But because Christ gave up his his own life for you and for me. Your life matters. We must humbly, though, first come to him because he humbly died for us. We must humble ourselves in the presence of the Lord because he will exalt us. We're in this spiritual war in our world today. We're in this battle we're reminded this morning that when we submit to ourselves and we submit to this world, we're enemies against the Lord, his word, and his people. But when we submit humbly to the Lord, because he's exalted, our hope and promise is that we will be exalted in this battle. But if not here on this earth in this battle, we will be exalted one day in eternity with him. Let's pray. Father, God, we humbly come before you and and just are, our hearts are heavy because of what's going on in our world and what's going on in our lives and different uncomfortable situations that we're faced with even on a daily basis, God. And we're reminded in your word that Sometimes we just focus too much on our own pleasures or our own thoughts or our own way of doing. And we need to humbly come before you, Lord, and say that we give you our all, God. We need to humbly come before you today and say that you are exalted. And because of you, we can trust in you and we will be exalted. God, I pray that this message is a message of hope this morning, that because of what Jesus did, we can have hope in Christ, and the things of this world are all gonna fade away, but we have a hope in eternal life, and let that spur in us to go share the good news of Jesus. God, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that has, have never humbled themselves before you and have just said, Lord, I, I admit 
that I'm a sinner. And because of that, I, I can't have a relationship with you. But I recognize that because of what Jesus did, because of this greater grace, it's nothing that I could do. You've already done it. That you have took my place on the cross when I deserved it. And it's a free gift. I pray if there's anyone who has not accepted you and trusted in you humbly this morning, that they will do that today. Today is the day of salvation. God, I pray that all of us in this room can respond this morning. We can ev- let this be a time where we can evaluate our own hearts. God, we pray that you'll cle- cleanse our hearts and purify our hearts that we can humbly come before you so you will be exalted and we're promised that we will be exalted as well, God. God, I pray that if there's any decisions or any hurts that need uh, to come before you this morning, that we will respond, all of us in this room can respond in the way that you've called us to respond this morning. If you're watching on our Sagamore Facebook Live or you're watching on our website, if you would like to respond today, you can text the word respond to 817-592-8513 and we would love to talk with you more about your decision today. This morning, if you're here with us, you're in our worship center or if you're in the student room in the family overflow room, if you are being called to respond today, Brother Ozell, Pastor Lewis will be back in the back and they would love to talk to you about your decision. Maybe you need to make a decision to join this church and be a part of the fellowship that God has called you to be in. Maybe you need to make things right with a brother and sister in Christ this morning. Maybe God's calling you to accept him this morning. Talk to someone before you leave today as Pastor Philip leads us in song. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see. T'was great. Pastor Taylor for that word that he's shared with us today. We thank you, Pastor Taylor. For those of you that are watching online, we we thank you for joining us, and we will see you soon with uh, Jesus in our heart and a smile and a mask on our face. Amen. For those of you that are here in the house, let's join together and let's sing our benediction theme song. As we go, may your...